Uh, well, I, I think that uh, they did see these as, as uh, um, branches that do have, in all senses, the ability to check and restrain each other. And so in that sense, that they were co-equal. But you may remember the famous line from the Federalist Paper about one branch being the least dangerous branch and so on and so forth. So they recognized that some branches had different functions that might, in different contexts, give them great, greater power in that respect. Uh, but I think they would have, of course, been very familiar to the language of separation of powers and would use that quite frequently as well. It's language that they probably got most uh, immediately from someone like Montesquieu. You would have thought that was a plant, and here's why. <laughs> I wrote a book called Thomas Jefferson and the Wall of Separation Between Church and State. So that's a place to start, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a, an interesting phrase. It's been around for a long time. Uh, in fact, interestingly enough, the very language, wall of separation between church and state, has been a part of Western discourse for at least 500 years. Think about that, 500 years. But what's interesting, it, it, it can be used in some profoundly different ways. So when someone asks me, well, what do you think about separation of church and state? My first response is to say, well, let's just stop and say, let's understand what we're actually talking about. What do you mean by separation of church and state? And then we can go from there and, and, and understand if that is consistent with my understanding of constitutional principles or not. Because again, this is an idea that can, can be used in tremendously uh, different ways. Now, I do think, in fact, that the Supreme Court's use of this metaphor, um, and the most pronounced use of the metaphor came in a case in 1947, a case called Everson versus Board of Education. And I think their use of the wall of separation is, is a use that would have been very unfamiliar to the American founding generation. And I don't want to take too much more on this uh, particular point, but again, encourage you uh, to take a look at my book on this subject. But um, I think when Thomas Jefferson used the phrase, and he's by no means the, the only founder to use this phrase, but when he uses the phrase, he's really speaking not about a separation between church and state, but he's talking about uh, a separation between uh, uh, the federal government and church. In other words, he was really making a point more about federalism the separation between a central authority and regional authorities, then he was referencing the separation of the church or religion in its various forms and the state at its various levels. So uh, I, I think it's... Um, I think you're hard-pressed to find a single founder who did not think that religion, uh, Christianity in particular, had a vital contribution to make to a system of Republican self-government. But that doesn't mean that there was consensus on all points, because I do think that there were some uh, other disagreements that lay beneath that. But let me just point out, um, you, you can find uh, 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 one of the things that distinguishes, I think, many Americans uh, who were adherents of the Enlightenment thought from their European counterparts is in Europe you found many adherents of Enlightenment that viewed someone like Jesus Christ as, as, as not a good guy, as kind of a fraud, a, a, a guy who perpetuated a hoax, right? You don't find that attitude in America uh, at the end of the 18th century. Uh, for the most part, the American founders, without exception uh, that I can think of, view Jesus as a virtuous man who was a great moral teacher. And whether you believed he was the son of God or not, he was something that, someone who could teach us those kinds of virtues that would allow us to govern ourselves. Thomas Jefferson, for example, who did not believe, in my opinion, that Jesus was the son of God, nonetheless, over and over again, dozens of times in his writing, speaks of Jesus as being the greatest moral teacher that ever was. Benjamin Franklin does the same thing. Even Thomas Paine on occasion would speak of Jesus as being a great moral teacher that we can learn from in this great civic project of self-government. Now, some of them, again, viewed the teachings of Christ as something that would transform the soul, 
in a very spiritual way. There were others who thought the teachings of Christ were great, but more simply as an instrument of utilitarianism, right? As an instrument of social control. I don't really need the, the teachings of Christ for myself, but the great unwashed masses probably do, right? So there's some disagreement as to exactly why they're embracing the virtues of the New Testament, for example, the moral teachings of, of Christ and the like. Uh, I think there's also disagreement on how religion expresses itself in the public sphere. And there would have been those who uh, certainly at the state and local level would have had what would have advocated for something approximating what we would today call an ecclesiastical establishment. That view does not prevail. It, 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 it uh, dies out by the early 19th century. Uh, there were others who thought that uh, the, the uh, influence of, 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 of the Bible, of religion in society, probably should take a more muted form through the, uh, the rectitude of leaders, uh, through things like uh, a, a day set aside in the public calendar for prayer, fasting, and thanksgiving. So there's some disagreement as to exactly how religion is to manifest, manifest itself in a beneficent public way. I do want to make one other point here that I think is really important. I've emphasized this idea that the founders believe the Bible is very important to, to developing this internal moral compass. And, and the founders, I think, with very few exceptions, believe that heartily. But they thought that that in itself may be inadequate. So there's a plan A, but there's also a plan B, which is, again, to design a system of government that understands even if we try to be virtuous people, in our fallen state we're going to fail. And that's why we need the plan B, which is that design, that structural design of government that takes fallen human nature into account and, and checks and balances uh, power that's vested in, in, in human political actors. Yes, uh, yeah, I think that's certainly true. And, uh, and, and I, I don't think we can gloss over that. And, and certainly, uh, that's something that if we had more time that we should uh, delve into. Um, one of the things, one of the questions I ask in my book is this, and, and this was one of the questions I had from the very beginning. Uh, are the founders, when they're using the Bible, are they using the Bible in ways that are consistent with traditional understandings of Scripture? Are they using the Bible uh, in ways uh, that are uh, consistent with the context in which a particular passage of Scripture is found? And, and my, my, my conclusion is it's a, it's, a mixed, uh, it's a mixed record. I think that there are some examples, and I give them in the book, where I think that they probably had a richer, deeper understanding of biblical text than we do today. Uh, there are other instances where I think, and I made a... a, a, a a brief allusion to this earlier, where I think that they really rip, as politicians often do, they ripped a text from its context in order to serve an immediate political objective. I mentioned earlier how they love some of these New Testament texts that use the word liberty, Galatians 5.1. Uh, I think that they understood that that was really stretching a bit. These were biblical texts, these are New Testament texts that were really speaking of, of Christian liberty, spiritual liberty, and they wanted to appropriate that language of liberty for a political purpose. And, and by the way, they often acknowledge that very point that yeah, maybe we shouldn't be quite using it this way, and I, and I give you a number of, of examples where they're acknowledging it, but they couldn't help themselves, right? They just love the resonance of that. New Testament language of liberty, and they wanted to use it. Um, so I, I think that uh, there's a mixed record. Sometimes, again, that they're using the Scripture in, I think, very nuanced, uh, right-on-the-money ways, and sometimes I think they're misappropriating Scripture to serve a political objective. Um, I can't say that I have uh, some really good examples are coming right to me, uh, but certainly I, I made some reference where uh, it's not unusual, not so much in the founding era, but in earlier periods to, to make these analogies uh, to uh, native peoples as being sort of like the Moabites or the Philistines, these people that uh, were, were rather dangerous to them. Uh, 
Uh, this is not uncommon in the 17th uh, century. I'm sure there's examples from the 18th century, but um, I, I'm not sure I could come up with a good one right now. Sorry. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I, I think it's a really hard question to answer in a very broad way. We'd almost have to look at specific texts and, and examples, um, because I, I, I can certainly think of many examples where they were very comfortable with using the language of Christianity as opposed to something a little bit more uh, generally. So think of examples where uh, in a given context they spoke of religion and then went on to say, and this is an idea that encompasses a variety of religious perspectives and they would use the language of that era. It would have included uh, perhaps language the Muslim, meaning the, the, the follower of Islam, and, or the Turk was a very common uh, phrase for referring to uh, the followers of Islam. Um, so rhetorically, you would find some of them going further and saying, I'm using religion here in a way that's, that's very encompassing. Now, how seriously do we take that? I, I have some uh, questions because they probably had not had a lot of interaction with other faith traditions. Uh, in their own world experience, their life experience, they had very little contact with outside uh, the, the realm of Protestantism. Let me just give you a little demographics here. In 1776, and again, it's kind of hard to, to sort of, uh, uh, with great accuracy, uh, develop the demographic uh, information here, but the best estimates are that in 1776, about 98% of all people living in America of European descent identified with Protestantism. Think about that, 98%. Now, there were maybe uh, 25 to 35,000 Roman Catholics. They were largely uh, limited to a couple geographical areas like Maryland, for example. And there were uh, just a tenth of that number of Jews, for example. So in their life experience, they did not have and had not had a lot of interactions outside the Protestant tradition. So sometimes you find them uh, encompassing uh, a very diverse view of religion when they use that language. Um, but again, I don't know what they really thought that meant to them given their limited life experience. Yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this, this, uh, this language of separation of church and state has been part of Western discourse for centuries, centuries. And, and one of the times in which it's being raised is in, in particular reference to some of the ecclesiastical battles of the age of, of William Tyndall and, and, and what uh, followed shortly thereafter. Um, and so, uh, and, and it was sometimes used in very disparaging ways. Uh, uh, the great... Uh, um, Judicious Hooker, for example, the great uh, uh, theologian of the Anglican tradition, uh, spoke of separation of church and state as a way of denigrating uh, the, the, the separatist and, and, and some of the more uh, Puritan uh, sects of his own age. So, yes, this is language that is coming into its own uh, at this particular time in history. And again, I'm referring specifically to that, that phraseology of separation of church and state. So I, I suppose my, my response here is first start by broadening the time frame here and say this is really a, a discussion and controversy that goes back to uh, the, the Puritan settlements, right? And uh, those who settled in places like Massachusetts were uh, not entirely of one mind, right? So part of what got Roger Williams, you remember the famous story of Roger Williams and the founding of Rhode Island, part of what gets him kicked out of Massachusetts Bay is, is a little bit of a debate over whether Massachusetts Bay is God's new Israel in some literal sense or, or whether it is not. And, and the prevailing view among the uh, leadership of, of Massachusetts Bay is that they are the new Israel and, and, and Roger Williams is not prepared to see it quite that way and, and he's banished for that. So I raise that to say that this is a long, long debate. And I don't think we can sort of say there was a consensus at any point. 
in American history on the, ver the various issues that you've raised here. Um, and I think that's also true of the founding era. There's not a, a, a consensus on that point. But certainly there were many uh, of the founding generation who uh, would have embraced language that would have sounded familiar to uh, the language of a, a kind of American exceptionalism. But I don't want to suggest that that was a, view, a consensus view. Uh, I think that would be going too far. Well, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. And, and I will say that um, the longest chapter in my book, uh, and, and the, probably the most challenging chapter for me to write, is on this precise topic. And uh, it's, it's a question, by the way, that the church has struggled with for hundreds and hundreds of years. The Americans are not the first to, to sort of ask the question, is there a right to resist uh, an ungodly or an unrighteous or a tyrannical ruler. And uh, one of the ways in which I see this debate framed in uh, the literature of the American founding is, is sort of a debate between passages like Romans chapter 13, the first seven verses, be in submission to those in authority over you, versus Acts 5.29, Remember Acts 5.29? This, uh, this is the text where uh, uh, Peter and the other apostles are preaching in the precincts of the temple and uh, the powers that be are not happy with them and throw them in jail. And the angel of the Lord comes and opens the prison gates and instructs them to go back out and, and preach again in the temple precincts. And that's what they do. And, and, and they're arrested or apprehended again. And they're brought before the rulers of Israel. And they say, didn't we tell you not to preach. And what did they say? We must obey God rather than man. And so this is a, a very ancient sort of tension uh, that Christians have sort of contended with. How do you sort of reconcile Romans 13 with Acts 5.29? And there's others, right? You could look at all those wonderful uh, stories from the Old Testament. Daniel defined the decree not to pray in public and, and, and other examples of that nature. Um, and Americans, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a very short response, I think. Americans of this generation, I believe, were very drawn to the way in which uh, the early reformers dealt with this uh, in, the, in the 16th century. Uh, the, the spread of Protestantism was just remarkable, spreading across the European continent. And very early on, within a generation, there are some very bloody conflicts between Catholic prince, princes and, and Protestant subjects. Um, there are bloody encounters in, in, in some of the uh, cantons of Switzerland. Um, there's the conflict between Knox and, and Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, probably the most dramatic is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France between uh, the Catholic King and the Huguenots. And these are, these are bloody, uh, violent uh, uprisings. And, and this, this uh, uh, compels uh, Protestants uh, very early on in the uh, Reformation to begin thinking about, is there a right of resistance? And uh, there is a uh, just a, a flood of, of theological literature that's written on this very question. And, and there is a perspective that says, yes, there is a right to resist a tyrannical ruler. In fact, it's a, it's a right that's articulated in Romans 13, right? Which seems a little bit counterintuitive. How do you read Romans 13? The argument goes, God has ordained the civil magistrate, the civil ruler, to rule for good. Right? To bear the sword for good. Right? Punish evil. And if your civil magistrate, the person who's calling themselves civil magistrate, is not serving the public good, that person has in essence deposed themselves, ceases to be the ruler, and ceases to be due the loyalty and obedience of their subjects. And so this is a kind of argument that Americans begin to make uh, and I've given it here in a very thumbnail uh, sketch way, they begin to make uh, as a way of justifying their rebellion against uh, Parliament and George III.
you know, I, I think that's a really hard question, and, and the truth is I'm always a little bit skeptical if someone's too certain about the answer to this question. Uh, he was a very private man, and I think he was private for a variety of reasons. One, I think it was part of his temperament, but I think he also, and he, he says this to, in, in some subtle ways in various places in his writings, that he sees himself as a public figure, a leader for everyone, and, and he's very cautious about taking positions, not just on religion, but other issues that might be of some controversy that might be alienating to, to others within the broader society. And so I think that too, in part, explains the certain uh, sort of hesitancy or uh, reticence on his part to, to be too clear about some of his uh, religious beliefs. Um, so I don't know, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. And, um, uh, and, and I think he was deliberately vague uh, in that regard. What I can say, I think, with, with some certainty uh, is a couple things. One is he was a very respectful man of religion. I, 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 I can think of very few of any examples where he says things that are denigrating of, of people of faith, faith traditions. Uh, he, he was annoyed at times with, with certain faith traditions. He was very annoyed with the Quakers, for example, during the war because they were pacifists and wouldn't aid in the cause, for example. But at the same time, he would turn around and say some very favorable things about the Quakers. Again, sort of showing a, a kind of public respect. I think we can also say with certainty that Washington was a person who believed that that religion was absolutely essential to the survival and success of Republican self-government. Probably the most famous line in all of Washington's papers comes from his farewell address, where he says, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. He says that in the farewell, and he says it many other times in, in his writings. So, you know, I think we can say with certainty that he believed a public role of religion is a vital part in the success of, of self-government. And, and I think part of the support for this comes in what he says in the very next line. Having said religion and morality are indispensable supports to political prosperity, in the next line he says, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these firmest props of human happiness. Now think about that for a second. What is, what is he saying? He's saying, if you're laboring to undermine that public role for religion, you can't call yourself a patriot. That's pretty stunning language. So he leaves us these little clues about his views on religion's public role, but I have a harder time in sort of knowing exactly where he was on the inside. Well, certainly uh, various visions of millennialism is a part of the American history, American story. Uh, it, it goes back to the Puritans and it continues, I would say, to the present day. There's various strange, there's, there's secular millennial visions that are play in our age today, I would say. Um, and uh, certainly in these periods of great revival, uh, there is a renewed fascination, a renewed interest with millennialism. Uh, there was, uh, uh, in some circles, an effort uh, perhaps to combine the, the, the tr remarkable transition of power to Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800 to a, a kind of secular millennialism. So, you know, this is a very, very pronounced theme. We, we see it in the, especially in the early 19th century with a number of uh, sort of new expressions of Christianity, uh, new denominations that are very sort of oriented towards millennial visions. Um, so. This is a huge topic. I just offer that as a few uh, brief observations. Yeah. So uh, there's a number of ways that I, I might uh, respond to that. Uh, let me give you an example of a, of a letter that uh, was written by Samuel Adams uh, in uh, late 1775, I believe. Uh, and it's a letter in which he's talking about the importance of virtue in political leaders. And uh, uh, he says, 
he says we could, you know, we could say that our security relies on, on armies. He says, but in reality, our security relies on the virtue of its people and its leaders. But I raise this here uh, because it's very interesting what he does next. He then gives an example from history, their history. He says, and, and he, he doesn't write these words in, he just uses the initials, but these are initials that would have been known to everyone. He says, it brings to mind the example of Dr. Benjamin Church. How many people remember Benjamin Church, right? Benjamin Church was essentially the Surgeon General of the Continental Army. And it turns out that General, uh, that uh, Dr. Benjamin Church was, was passing secrets to General Gage on the other side. And he was doing it through his mistress. He was sending these secrets to his mistress. Now that was really important for the illustration that that uh, uh, Adams is making there because he says, he says, guys, he says, we all knew that Dr. Church was a traitor to his wife long before he was a traitor to his country. And that should have tipped us off. So I think that's one of many, many examples I think that we could point to uh, that might illustrate this. Now, I have a, a chapter in the book on uh, the righteous ruler. Uh, what, what, what did it mean to be a righteous ruler? And I've already given you some indicators of texts that they would have turned to. Uh, they, they were drawn to uh, uh, Proverbs 28, chapter 28 and chapter 29, which is very interesting. I'd encourage you, go read uh, uh, Proverbs 28 and 29 because uh, it, 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 it has been interpreted and viewed by many commentators over the centuries as essentially a handbook for a ruler. It lays out all kinds of, of, of advice for what a good ruler would do. They were especially drawn to chap, uh, Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. Now let's put this in context. The children of Israel have just crossed over the Red Sea, and all of the burdens and responsibilities of government are falling on the shoulders of Moses. And you remember his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and says, Moses, you need some help. You're going to work yourself into an early grave. This is my paraphrase, by the way. He says, you're going to work yourself into an early grave unless you get some help. You need to select some people that are going to help you. And he lays out in Exodus 18.21 the kind of character you need in a leader, right? These are able men who fear God, who tell the truth, and hate, you remember? Hate covetousness, hate covetousness. And, and this was uh, uh, probably as much as any text uh, from Scripture in discussions of what is a good ruler, this was the text that they would have turned to and they would have had an extensive discussion on, on what each of those elements might have meant.